How's everybody doing this morning? Blessings and glory. Turn to somebody. Blessings and glory and honor in the name of Jesus to you. Just say that to them while I'm getting set up here. And uh, see if my iPad still works. Now, you see this position? The other day I was doing this, and because of my COVID-19, my 19 pounds I gained during COVID, my pants ripped from the top all the way down to the bottom. And worse yet, I didn't know it. And I had several stops on the way home I made. So I'm sure I was quite the topic of conversation and put on quite a show for several people. So anyway, but praise God, we are here now. We're loving Jesus, and my pants are intact. There's no need to be concerned about that. Oh, <laughs> good, good. Who said good? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And by the way, Bob, that was my lame clap over there a minute ago, so... Hey, everybody, just a couple of things that are really important. Many of you know Pastor Ryan has resigned from The Rock. He's been such a precious blessing to us here at The Rock, and God has called him away. They're moving to Atlanta to uh, engage the call of God in their lives for this season, and we have a special celebration service this coming Sunday, a week from today. Pastor Ryan will be bringing the word, and we'll be loving him and saying goodbye to him in that time. So we want to encourage all of you to make that and be a part of that. That'll be a blessing and fun to celebrate. I got to get situated here. Also, too, you can get the sermon notes online. There's a QR code right up here, or you can go to therockofroseville.com and get those there. One more final announcement that I have, because Pastor Bob just can't handle this level of detail. <laughs> um, we, are, we actually have our awesome annual school backpack outreach. Now, we know schools aren't in session, and so we don't need the backpacks, but kids who are being homeschooled still need those school supplies. So we're going to go ahead. The Rock has allotted $1,500 to buy those school supplies. We're going to have teams of people flow through uh, a neighborhood over here and distribute flyers, letting them know that on August the 1st, the 8th, and the 15th, they'll be able to go right across the street over here to our clothing store. And there will be teams of people there who will be giving out those school supplies, handing out some snacks and praying for people and reaching out to people in the community. So we need your help. It's a big undertaking. And so if this is something that you would like to volunteer for and be a part of, uh, we want to encourage you to go to the Rock website and fill out the volunteer form, and it will be uh, something that you will be blessed for participating in. This is kind of a fun morning for me. Um, my daughter, for the f not, I mean, she speaks often, but for the first time, we're both speaking on the same Sunday morning. She's speaking at her church in Lincoln. I'm speaking here. We compared sermon notes to see what we had going on, and uh, uh, it's it's going to be fun. Also, too, a couple of months ago, some we we had a real move of God in high school, and some of those buddies of mine that I played football with have all gotten together, and we do fellowship once a week on Zoom. All my old high school buddies that I haven't seen in decades. And so several of them are out there watching online. So, hey, guys, good to see you. Blessings to you. So this is, uh, uh, if I get over into the flesh, I could allow the weight of the responsibility of what I say here to really kind of burden me down because we're going through a lot. The church is, our culture, our society is going through a lot. And what is the timely word? What is the thing? Oh, there's some people back here too. Uh, the, what is the timely word for us in this season that we can share because we know that the word of God is effective and it can bless us. So to we have been in the, the, the book of Peter for quite some time and um, – you know, the, uh, the title of our sermon series is Character in Crisis. 
And so looking at that and taking that into consideration, how can we derive the most from this passage of Scripture to minister to us currently where we are in this season that we are in? And I think it's important to really understand the context, the people who, who Peter wrote this letter to, what they were going through. And so we're going to do just a little bit of review. So let me know if some of this sounds familiar to you when I described the time of that day. Rome was the world's superpower. It had the strongest economy. It had the world's strongest military it was comprised of many countries that had been conquered. And no doubt, there was racial tension among those different people groups. And it was in the process of imploding. Now, just let me know if any of this sounds familiar to you, because some of it does. And we are in a very challenging time right now. Now, this letter was written to the Gentiles, and it was a letter written to those that were dispersed across Asia Minor, which is now, is now Turkey. But these churches had been dispersed because of the persecution that they were under. So this letter was written not just to one single church, it was written specifically for the purpose of being spread throughout multiple Gentile churches in Asia Minor. Now, the persecution that came to them was from the fact that if you were a slave, and many of them were, you were expected by the culture of that day to worship the gods of the, the, your master, the household you were in. So you can imagine being a believer every day, getting up in a household in which you were a slave and being expected to bow to the gods of that household and not doing it knowing that there was an impending potential beating and persecution that you would experience from that. It's kind of a tough situation to be in, isn't it? It is really challenging. Now, also, too, there's something really important to make note of. How many of you remember the story of Peter and Cornelius? How Peter went to Cornelius' house, who were all Gentiles. And at this point in the story, 10 years after the ascension of Christ, the apostles still weren't really clear, can non-Jews be saved? 10 years after the ascension. They're still grappling with this issue. And Peter goes to Cornelius' house, begins to speak the gospel to them. They all repent, and the Holy Spirit falls on them. And Peter witnesses, God does save Gentiles. It's confirmed. He has to go back to the apostles and debate with them and convince them, yes, God actually does save Gentiles. So turn to somebody and say, thank God I'm a Gentile. That's 10 years after Christ ascends into heaven. Then here we are, 30 years later, Peter is writing this letter to the churches in Asia Minor, to the believers. And not only does Peter speak against all of the social impact and all of the challenges that is going on in their minds and in their hearts and all the suffering Think about that. Think about the challenge that that would present to you. You know, there was some uncertainty. Can a Gentile be a Christian? Our minds can play tricks on us. I don't know if yours does, mine does. I can talk myself out of something pretty quick if I let myself do it. And they're sitting there, gosh, why am I undergoing all of this suffering? Maybe I'm not really a Christian. I'm a Gentile. Jesus came to save the Jews. And you could take that line of thinking and understandably talk yourself right out of wanting to go through the suffering and the persecution that is facing you. But in that context, and this is beautiful, Peter throws the full weight of his revelation into this letter as he speaks to these suffering Christians. And he says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. You were once not, 
the people of God. Now you are the people of God as Jesus speaks to their identity, your identity. Amen. It's a powerful thing. He calls them the exiled, a language that was specifically reserved for Jews in that day. He calls them the dispersion, which is what the Jews were called when they were uh, exiled in Babylon. And in this letter, Paul calls Rome Babylon. He's drawing every comparison possible to let them know that they are God's chosen people. Which brings us to a point, our identity is important when we're undergoing suffering. Our, we stand in who Christ is, who we are in Christ, that we are sons and daughters of the living God. And we can wear our suffering as a badge of honor in any season. This was good counsel to the church. And if you think about it, that Roman imperial empire is gone. The church is still here. What's up is down and what's down is up. When we humble ourselves as a church, we are exalted. And I think it's important to realize that if something isn't really tested, how do we really know what it's worth? If something doesn't go through the fire and survive on the other end, how do we really know what it's worth? Now, we have the benefit of all of the saints before us who have suffered and martyred for their faith. And we can look to their example, but they didn't have that. This was a new church. They were amongst the firstborn, and they were going through this suffering for the first time in many cases in their mind and in their thinking. And I think it's important to remember that it's not the test that proves God's strength in us. It is our response to it that determines the outcome. Isn't that right? See, two people can go through a trial one can crawl up in a fetal position and never come out. And another person can emerge as an influencer and a leader. It is our response, the treasure in our heart, that determines what's going to be the end result of this test and trial that we were in. So what do we need to take away from Peter's counsel to the church? How can we respond well and glorify God in our current situation as Christians in California in the year 2020. Do we want to respond well? Amen. We want to respond well. Our other alternative is we can move to Idaho. Ah, see, that was a good, that was my wife's joke. She, you can give her credit for that. So in order to promote their sobriety, their right thinking, to the clarity of thought, and to not be confused, Peter does something three times. Because how many of you know confusion is dangerous? It really is. He's trying to keep them clear-headed, keeping them focused on what's really important, maintaining their faith, not being discouraged, and don't lose the right perspective. Peter felt it was necessary to do something three times in chapter 2 and in chapter 3 and in chapter 4. Peter clearly defines suffering. And I think this is an important point to make because sometimes we can get hit from all of these different directions with all different kinds of suffering and our emotions can cloud our thinking and we can begin to deceive ourselves. So let's read the portion of scripture that the Lord has for us this morning. And it is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. And again, like I said, this is in chapter 2 and in chapter 3 as well. I've chosen this one. 
He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. That's a key word. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God and his glory rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. In other words, don't suffer for being stupid. Suffer for what's right. And yet, if any of you suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in the name of Jesus. Amen. And that's what Peter is really trying to clarify here, that there is a difference between suffering for righteousness sake. And that's what the Bible means about fellowshipping and Christ's sufferings or suffering for unrighteousness sake or deserved suffering. It's either seeds we've sown or neglect we've lived in that have created a consequence or born a fruit that we are living in right now. And Peter is really separating those two so they have clarity of thought on what they're going through. Because I've seen people in my life talk about all types of suffering that come from different venues, which there is three. There's common suffering which is suffering that everybody experiences, righteous or not, due to being in a fallen world. And then there's unrighteous suffering, and then there's suffering for the sake of Christ. That's the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Jesus didn't suffer for unrighteousness sake. Jesus was purely righteous. So here in this passage, Peter finds it very important to make that distinction. Now, in thinking about this, how do we suffer for righteousness sake in the United States? I mean, it's not every day you drive down the road and you see somebody beaten for their faith and it's okay, it's legal, and everybody just turns and walks away. That's not the context we live in. And when you're in a, a country that is filled with Christian influence, and a lot of the laws were born out of a Judeo-Christian ethic, you're pretty good. You're pretty well off. But my daughter, Stephanie, pointed something out to me, that in 2 Peter 3.12, all who de desire to live a righteous life will be persecuted. So how are we in the United States persecuted for the sake of righteousness because it does happen and uh, uh, a good friend of mine which I have to say this message is the byproduct of many people I used our community group as a sermon prep team as well as the men's group on Thursday mornings that we have and several other people my daughters included my wife I get input from all kinds of people And somebody pointed out that the dictionary definition for suffering is physical pain, which is rare in the United States, and mental anguish. Now, that's where this starts to bring things home. One of the most, well, I'm going to get to that later. We can experience mental anguish through the loss of jobs the loss of business or income. I know somebody right now who is a vendor to a large corporation and because she has not openly supported certain political persuasions on Facebook and because of her biblical worldview that she has, she is being eliminated from their vendor list and she will lose income for that conviction. That is suffering for righteousness sake. She has made that stand because of what she believes to be true regarding her faith. I have experienced that myself where I have decided in my life, I can't do this anymore. I don't think it's right. I don't, I can't work in this situation. It doesn't have other people's best interest at heart. 
uh, I'm going to leave this job and go somewhere else. I've had to make that choice before. That is suffering lack and suffering the consequence of our faith and our deep convictions. Another thing is in mental anguish is a loss of relationships. You know, they say that a divorce is the most traumatic thing a family can go through, even above the death of a loved one. Loss of relationships is really a true source of suffering. Sometimes it doesn't matter how gracious and how humble we are or not. Our stand on the truth will alienate people from us. When we don't understand with clarity why we are suffering, we get confused and filled with emotions that can cause us to deceive ourselves and lose our mental sobriety. And that's why Peter in chapter 1 says, be sober-minded. Think clearly. And here in this passage of Scripture, Peter is fighting for their mental clarity. Here's some clear thinking. The worldview on change is get rid of the people who don't share your opinion. Eliminate them from the equation, if by necessary, violence, and separate themselves from among you. A biblical worldview is to repent of our sin and restore those relationships into fellowship. Evil always wants to divide us. The kingdom and God and the love of God always wants to unite us. And remember, Jesus looked through his suffering on the cross and forgave us for our sin. I realize that there are times that we need to stand up to social injustice and do it out of the love of God in our heart. But don't wear it as an emotional chip on your shoulder or you will alienate the very people that need to experience the love of God through the relationship that you have with them. Don't use your revelation and your clarity to judge others. That's pride. Use it to be a blessing to those, those that you come in contact with. We are a light in this season, in this generation. Let's be sober-minded. And remember, the real crisis here is that people don't know Jesus. They've never experienced the love of God. They don't know that God loved them so much that he gave his son to die for their sin. That's the real crisis. And that trumps everything. Can I use that word, Trump, Bob? Did I get too political right there? It's close, borderline, borderline. So here are some indicators that we can talk to ourselves and ask ourselves, am I really weathering this storm this season well in this crisis? Number one is the health of our identity. Are we in relationship with God? Are we receiving our identity from him? And are we standing firm on that and not the social mores of our day? Number two, our relationships with others. Are we valuing our relationships over the, all of the covidiacy that is happening at this time? Are we valuing those relationships and making them a priority? Another is we have to watch out for our missional decay. We need to stay on mission as a church. I was in a board meeting last night, a couple of nights ago, with uh, within Reach Global in Thailand. And they were talking about the 
amount of Christians that were in that country, 0.76%. Now, I didn't say 7.6%. I said 0.76% in Thailand, and it's been that way for 200 years. We have never been able to tip that up for the last 200 years. And so the missionaries who go over there and try and try and come against the strongholds over a period of time, they, they become discouraged either consciously or subconsciously and quit trying as much. And they experience what the missionaries call their a missional decay. We stop taking our eyes off of what's really important. Are we connected to God's plans in this season or have they been upstaged by our own self-preservation? I want to ask you to, to examine your heart seriously and see because we do need to stay on mission. And finally, Peter's message here is be holy because being holy not only loves and honors God in a real way, it is also the strength and genuineness of our testimony to others. Peter was telling them that as you're persecuted, as you're beaten for righteousness sake, return that evil with good. Love those people and by your witness, by prioritizing them as people, they see a genuine display of God's love. This is what Peter wrote to the church in that time, and I believe it is a message for us right now. And sometimes we might feel like, man, that's hard. I mean, I, I have a relationship right now, a kingdom relationship that is significant. It's been going for a long time. And there's a struggle in that relationship because of differences of opinion uh, concerning what's going on in our society today. And it has yet to be resolved. And I have experienced anguish in that because I love that person. I've seen and heard of people who will butcher each other on social media. We can't fall into that trap. We have to love people with the truth. Love people with the truth. So as I was going through this message, I really didn't know how to land this plane. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's a good word, I believe it, but God, what can I say to wrap this up? And out of left field, the Lord ministers a word to me. And sometimes it feels like it has nothing to do with this message, but in reality, it has everything to do with it. James wrote in chapter 5, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. Now, that's not only talking about us as a body of believers. And look, I know that in some churches it can be a little unfashionable to talk about sin, but let me assure you it's real, it's here, and it will jack you up. I have a friend who always used to say, sin will grab you when you don't expect it, take you where you don't want to go, and keep you there longer than you want to stay. Sin is real. How do we bring the cross and the power and the strength of the cross into our daily lives on a regular basis? We confess our sins to one another and pray for each other and activate the power of God's grace in our kingdom relationships. But this doesn't only go for those of us who have friends and family in the body of Christ. And let me just pause and stay here for a minute. If there's nobody here in this church that you would feel comfortable with sitting down and confessing sin and praying with, 
you need to get involved in community because you will find those relationships there. Not only confessing our sins to one another, but going and asking forgiveness to those people who we have offended through this crisis. Am I touching a soft spot right here? Relationships that we have had, things that we have said to people that have strained our relationship with them, I am encouraging you to go to them and repent and let them know how much you love them. And remember, Jesus suffered on the cross to restore our relationship with him. If we want to fellowship in his sufferings, we will go low and humble ourselves in order to restore our relationships with others. And when we humble ourselves in those relationships, we are exalted in due time. This is how we take the power of the cross to our walk and in our daily lives. We need the gospel every day of our lives to live in the strength of what God has called us to. Otherwise, this is a daunting task and we can't do it. Let's take up our cross daily. Let's all stand. This is the challenge of our faith. The amazing thing is that when we repent, the Bible says there's a time of refreshing and restoration. Ask yourself, in order to stay on mission, who is your mission right now? Who are the people that you need to go to and confess your sin and make amends and let them know that they are way more important to you than any social construct or division that's going on in this generation. I'm reminded of the scripture in Corinthians 15, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Father, we call on you, your strength, the power of the cross, Lord to draw us in deeper with you into relationship and to bless and inspire relationships with others, Father. That we might be able to love them as effectively as possible and lay down our lives for them and bless them and not curse. Father, we love you. And Jesus, we want to be just like you. Take our hearts, God. Show us your plan and purpose for our lives. May the church be the church, and may we rise up in the grace and love of God in this season. Jesus name. Will somebody say it? Amen. Awesome. Was this too heavy or was this okay? I didn't bring the hammer down too much, did I? Awesome. Good. Because you know what? A relationship isn't worth having if it doesn't have invitation and challenge. We need to be challenged once in a while. And we need to be clear thinking and sober minded. So this is a good thing. We love you guys. Be blessed. Make sure you come next week to honor Pastor Ryan as we say goodbye to him, who has been such a huge blessing to this body and will continue to be, I'm sure. God bless you guys. Have an awesome Sunday on this beautiful morning.